And, and these two top, uh, I, I would say, um, uh, steps, you know, the analyze step and the infuse step are, of course, you know, extremely key. And this is where uh, the analyze steps where, you know, we've been doing a lot of investment in the past several years on power. And this is uh, essentially where you take the data that's sitting inside your operational stores or your traditional data warehouses, and then you're bringing it into what's called a so-called AI grid or an AI cluster. And then you have data scientists or AI engineers who are training from those various data sets. So you have your operational data, which could be structured data um, and you know, tabular data and numeric. And then you have a lot of your unstructured data, which is either coming in from um, you know, social media sources or third party providers. Uh, there's a lot of data that's being accrued in the enterprise through third party providers. And then you build models or you do analysis um, you know, on this historical data that's you know, coming into this AI grid. And then today we're going to focus on um, you know, this particular step, you know, what we call infuse. And infuse is about taking the models that you are building, you know, either in the cloud, either on this AI grid, and then running it across the enterprise. And if you think about this problem a bit, this is kind of a very critical problem because let's say you, um, you know, you're, you're providing a model or a solution for risk analysis. Whether you are applying that model when you're accessing uh, you know, the company services through a web interface or when transactions are coming into uh, you know, your operational systems, the rules that you apply to do the risk analysis have to be consistent. And also it so happens that you know, a model that's running inside a web server or a model that's running inside the operational store might depend on parameters like, uh, like time and date. And all this has to be the right format because imagine if you, you supply you know, uh, you know, a data and a time in Unix format, but it's expecting it in a Julian format, then clearly your model execution is, is going to be, you know, uh, completely uh, 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 not what you expect. And, and so it's very critical that the data inputs that you feed uh, are consistent and the models that you apply for risk are also consistent across the enterprise. And, and, and so this is one of the factors that we look at for infusion. Uh, the other aspect about infusion that's very key is, and infuse has a separate meaning. A lot of people think that infusion is, you know, injecting a model in the path of a transaction. You know, you do a, a SQL statement, apply that against a database, and then you have a UDF or a user defined function that pulls data out. And that does something, um, you know, where you apply a model that's say looking for an outlier in a column in the database. But you want to make sure in infusion, infusion is saying that you trust the predictions of the model. So this is also incorporating trust and transparency. So when you're infusing a model, this isn't just about placing a model in the path of a transaction. This is also saying that you're able to trust the predictions of the transaction so that you can you know, apply this to your business process. And, 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 and so, in this discussion, you hear a lot about you know, data and models, but I just want to uh, assure you that a, a lot of our focus is on the business process, right? Because the software products you build and deploy for your clients are all based on microservices, business processes. And what we're trying to do here is use data and models so that your clients and, can make money and save money, right? And also we want to make sure that um, with these models that you are building uh, make your KPIs of the business process better. Because that's ultimately the goal of AI is to make money and save money. And when you think of this, it's easy to get lost into data and models. And if you're a data scientist like me, that's probably something that you look at. But I work a lot with business leaders and business executives. And, and usually the conversation there is about what is the use case or the business problem that you want to make better? What KPI do you want to improve? How can we use AI to make those KPIs better? That's ultimately what we're going after. So, um, so cognitive systems, um, you know, uh, the business unit in IBM, you know, we're essentially organized across these three pillars, if you will, right? Hybrid cloud, enterprise Linux, and then, you know, AIX and IBM I. So hybrid cloud, as you know, is, essentially uh, our new CEO, 
Arvind Krishna's uh, prerogative. And here, what we're trying to do is take the traditional IT assets that uh, enterprises have and that you build software products for and be able to seamlessly integrate that with assets that are in the public cloud. So you could develop an asset uh, inside the public cloud and then we provide pathways to bring that on-prem so that uh, let's say you could maybe even train a model um, you know, on-prem or you know, have a dev test environment in the cloud where you could create an asset and then bring that asset on-prem which could be a microservice or a you know API binary that could be applied on your operational data. So this use of traditional IT assets as well as um, you know IBM cloud assets or cloud assets that can be spun up at will um, is 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 very key. And if you look at AI, having that capability is so very critical because as you can imagine, you know you've got your traditional IT assets, and and those of you who work very closely with IT administrators know that, you know, some of these systems are very closely protected because they're operational stores, they run 24 by seven. And if you're trying to bring in some kind of an experimental AI asset that does some predictions or is looking at application logs to predict, you know, when the next application failure might happen, sometimes when you're, you know, doing a proof of concept, it's easier to do it outside the traditional IT uh, domain in, in the cloud Right, and from the IT infrastructure, I could do a microservice call into the cloud. That gives me some predictions or gives me, you know, some forecasting numbers, uh, sales forecasting or what have you. But then you're able to sort of separate your development as well as your production, right? And so you can evolve these separately and, and you're not tied down to the operational constraints within which those new assets have to be, you know, brought up, raised, and then uh, evolved. Um, and then enterprise Linux is, of course, those of you who build products around SAP HANA, the analytic engine, SAS VIA, and then, of course, you know, we now have our sister company, Red Hat, which is an independent company, but, of course, um, you know, uh, IBM uh, did, uh, you know, these Red Hat and IBM did merge, uh, um, you know, last year. Uh, we are heavily focused on OpenShift and uh, a mechanism by which you can take applications um, that are monolithic and then containerize them and make them into microservices so they're modular. You can compose these microservices and then de deploy them on enterprise Linux. Um, and you know, whether it's, uh, you know, it's smaller boxes in a cluster or it's a large SMP box. And then of course, AIX and IBMI, this is the traditional IT infrastructure that uh, all our uh, you know, enterprise clients depend on. And especially I can tell you that during the pandemic, uh, you know, we, you know uh, our uh, executives have been working very, very closely with the leaders of some of the, uh, you know, leading companies. You can imagine, you know, uh, healthcare uh, uh, companies that run prescription services, right? And then of course, retail, right? All of these were overloaded as people start, started, uh, you know, staying at home. But yet, because we have capabilities like capacity on demand because our systems are engineered to be up for 10 years and you can selectively bring up and bring down portions of the system, we were able to support that, uh, that extra demand seamlessly. And that's why, as you know, a lot of our clients come to us and you build software for because our platforms are designed for resilience, not just resilience in the hardware, but also resilience in the software. So end to end, you get a highly a resilient system. And we have a roadmap. We're continuously investing, as Gina said, you know, um, and I have some charts on uh, the latest uh, Power 10 announcement. We have some special accelerators inside Power 10 to really speed up AI, and it's very, very exciting. And then, of course, we're continuously uh, investing in the roadmap. So let's look at how our AI strategy is evolving. And it's kind of very interesting because, you know, when we came up with the strategy, this was you know, before the stay-at-home orders were issued, um, you know, in, in various countries across the globe. And we were doing a lot of what I talked to you about, you know, the so-called AI grid, right? So the idea is that you extract, transform, load data out of operational stores, your data warehouses from Hadoop and your data lakes. You bring that into an AI grid, say running your favorite file system, say GPFS, right? And then you were training models, running lots and lots of users, on those models, and then you use some of the popular accelerators to do that. 
right? And so, and it made a lot of sense doing that because, you know, as you know, a lot of this AI revolution started in 2012. And then when we started doing this with our accelerated systems, GPU-based systems, um, you know, we started doing that six, seven years ago. So clients uh, and, you know, also, you know, our partners were building software assets and playing with them. It was more of a sandbox. Hey, what can AI do for me, right? The classical machine learning, you know, that's been happening for the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, right? A lot of these algorithms have been invented, you know, several decades ago. And, and now we're bringing in the new capabilities to look at text and, and analyze that. Um, to be and, and, and now, as you know, some of you might know, some of these models are so sophisticated that, for example, OpenAI um, does not, you, you know, release some of their models because you have, for example, there's a model called GPT-3 that you can simply write a few sentences on what the software should do and it'll automatically do code generation, right? Or in, in a nefarious use case, and you know, it, it, it is election time in the US that if I, you know, write a, a few sentences, then this model could actually generate additional text that uh, adds on to the few sentences. So you can imagine, um, you know, all the bots that could be created, right? If you could manipulate text and then, you know, just, uh, you know, create, uh, you know, essentially this Twitter storm, you know, use, using these bots, right? So that model was actually not released by OpenAI because, you know, it could be used for nefarious purposes. So AI has, uh, you know, evolved, uh, uh, to this point where, you know, that's why IBM is championing AI ethics and making sure that AI is used only for good purposes and we think of ourselves as good tech and, and not for these nefarious purposes, um, you know, and it is a double-edged sword. You can use it for good and also you could use it for all these other nefarious purposes. So, so, th so that's essentially what we focused on is, um, you know, trying to build these models and, you know, providing clients and our partners a, a platform to, you know, experiment with. But, you know, and it's kind of interesting because when we formulated the strategy, this was before the pandemic. But with the pandemic, as you know, what is happening is the digital transformation explosion. Um, and, you know, I, I work a lot with clients and, and partners and, and, you know, although I'm, you know, working from home, you know, I, you know, talking to people, I get a good sense of, you know, how the business is evolving, right? So we know that all these digital interactions and digital transactions, we think that, you know, well, you know, since March, it's been six months, but we think that we've had at least three to five years worth of uh, evolution that's happened in the digital transformation side, right? Because the digital interactions are going, right? Using chats, using things like that. And so to be able to apply AI, so you can, you know, uh, take a chat request and automatically you know, satisfy that using an AI or sending it to, or routing it to, um, you know, a human, right? May, being able to make that decision, being able to make that customer experience more interesting. And then if you can see some of the big retailers, like if you're in the U.S., you know, Target and Walmart, right? Their, their, their digital sales, online sales have doubled and tripled, right? In fact, uh, there was a New York Times article about how the sales of Target and Walmart actually exceeded, you know, even Amazon, right? And um, so... So the digital transformation explosion is happening really, really fast. And those of you who are, you know, manufacturing and supply chain on this call kind of know that, you know, that means that, you know, your supply chains are now being put under stress and pressure. And especially if you're depending on raw material and at the pace of, you know, the movement of some of these, you know, essential products is happening so quickly, you have to then, you know, uh, make sure that the raw material coming in, you know, uh, is, it has uh, enough surplus so that, you know, you can account for the demand. So, so our focus now is on where is the business value being generated, right? So the business value is being generated when a particular customer interacts with your system, transactions come into your system, that's where the business value is. So that's where we want to go. We want to follow the business value trail, which means that we want to look at taking these models and you can build them anywhere. You know, you build them on the cloud, you build them on your favorite platform, but we don't want to just focus on models that are built on power systems. We want to take models that are built anywhere, right? And, and we understand that these models could be built by your clients or by yourself on Amazon or Google or whatever cloud. But whatever these models that are being built, um, you know, we, uh, there's facilities by which we can bring them uh, onto the power systems platform. 
There are standards that are coming up uh, called Onyx, uh, Open Neural Network Exchange, that allow different training systems to talk the same protocol, right? So you can kind of think of it like, you know, XML, JSON. It really is like a, you know, a hum uh, so if you look at PMML, those of you familiar with predictive markup language, that is XML format. And, and this is kind of more like a, the Google protobuf format. So models talk the same language, the same protocol. So you can train it on one system and then bring it, um, you know, uh, onto the power system. And because you're talking the same language between the place where the models would run and the place where the models are generated, you can have the seamless interaction. So we want to focus on where the business value is being generated. That is at a customer interactions when transactions strike the database, when you make queries on the database, where your products are running, where those business processes are running. And, and, and we want to be there. So to take those models, bring those in and help you not just run the model, but make sure that if your model is drifting from the predictions it's supposed to make, then being able to retrain that model right on time so that you know, you're not uh, missing out in terms of predictions, you're not getting too many false positives or too many false negatives. And if you're making high value decisions based on those predictions, you wanna make sure that, that you know, you're not um, in any way you know, losing money because you're making wasteful decisions based on those models. So we wanna give you the capability, not just to run the models, but also to keep the models updated. And, and also we, we have the facilities so that uh, clients, when they're running certain models, will be able to explain some of those decisions. So let's say you know, you're building products that are regulated by internal regulators or external regulators um, that are audited. You wanna make sure that, let's say you know, you, you're building a product for loan approval, uh, especially in, you know, in countries where this is regulated, you're, that you're making uh, decisions that are fair, that are not biased in any way because you trained it on data uh, that is biased. So, so, um, so we wanna help you grapple with all those things and focus on operationalizing these models inside the business processes. So this is going back to looking at the software products you're building. Think of those in terms of business processes if, if you think that you wanna harden the, uh, the, the fault tolerance of your applications, then how can you look at application logs and, and then be preemptive in terms of when uh, you know, failures could happen and being able to allocate resources ahead of time. And if you're looking at certain KPI, for example, you're doing forecasting, say sales forecasting or some other kind of time series, then you wanna make sure that uh, you're, you're able to do that with much more sophisticated models that kind of look for the ahead in time, especially with this pandemic, and, and be able to support you with those uh, forecasting decisions. So, so that's what our focus is shifting on. And, and this kind of naturally fits in with, you know, the so-called post-pandemic IT, right? Because that's where the challenges are, is that this digital transformation is happening at such a fast pace, the value is being generated where a customer and transactions interact with the client, uh, interact with your products that you're building, and we want to be able to provide AI support there um, because that's kind of where the uh, the business value is. So we can make money, save money. Uh, IBM and 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 you are partners for 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 our common clients. So so the value proposition is you know we want to be able to uh, support ease of deployment, uh, deploy these models very easily, uh, you, you know, in these uh, operational systems, operationalizing them. Uh, we want to help you with uh, performance. So, so performance is, uh, you know, the KPI. So keeping up with, especially, let's say you're doing real-time inferencing. Let's say you're doing some kind of a, you know, pre-approval, right? Uh, especially if you're in the U.S., right? Because of the interest rates going down, there was a, uh, a very high uptick in terms of, you know, refinancing for mortgages that happened. And and so there's a, you know, a pre-approval process and. And, and, uh, and, and different mortgage companies have been vying for that business. So can I, you know, in the envelope of a transaction, uh, approve a client's refinance application, right? So that I don't have to go and, you know, give you an answer an hour later, two hours later, but within the envelope of a transaction, as you go and fill up, you know, five fields, you submit that and you already have that pre-approval so you can go and then start taking, you know, the next step. So this is, not just in terms of you know, meeting the transaction rates, but also in terms of delivering the model KPI uh, so that you can provide these predictions you know, that are consistent 
with the uh, the KPIs for your business. And then, of course, you know, robustness. So this is building on the traditional robustness. So if you have products that run on IBM I and AIX, right, the hardware that IBM builds is trusted, right? Because we do things inside the hardware that give you, make that a fortress. It's impenetrable, right? And then, of course, AIX and IBM I are operating systems, you know, that have been written by IBM. So these are trusted uh, software. Then they're, they're not, uh, you know, built by open communities. Um, these are completely trusted operating systems. And clearly, if you run a model that's on top of a, you know, AIX, IBM I, as well as you want that also be trusted. And so we have, um, you know, uh, a lot of research coming from our, our research lab, our several thousand research scientists, and we've addressed this problem, what we call adversarial robustness. So just as in computer security, you worry a lot about how your systems are going to be hacked the same way, uh, you know, um, there, there, you know, a lot of bad guys out there. They're looking at ways by which they can pump, say, white noise into a model, right, and make a model think that a cat's a dog, or you know, make make it think that you know a, a good transaction, um, you know, a bad transaction is actually a good transaction. And so, this kind of adversarial robustness, as, a, as it's called, that we think in terms of IT and computer security, we want to bring to AI as well, right? So the entire platform, end to end, is trusted. Right, so that's what we're doing as IBM. We gave the world for the last hundred years, right, impenetrable security, and that's why people come to us in the hardware, in the operating system, and now we're taking that enterprise quality of service into AI as well, right? And if you look at, uh, there's very few companies. In fact, there's one company doing it, and that one company is IBM, right? Where because we know that we can't just take you know models and put them on because then the weakest link is that model because that's not robust. Right, so we guarantee end-to-end -end robustness. So when you buy our hardware, the operating system and the AI end-to-end -end is robust so that you get the resilience and the robustness that you're getting from the hardware and the operating system in AI as well. All right, so, so this is the chart that I was talking about that I promised before. So let's now just look at the uh, providence of data as well as models so you get a good handle on you know, when you deploy your products in the enterprise. And by the way, you know, I work a, a lot with clients. So this is actually a view that's coming from different sectors, right? Healthcare, manufacturing, retail, finance. And I've kind of taken this view of working with clients for the past several years uh, in data and AI, and I'm trying to give you a picture of how, uh, I think this is a pattern that kind of reflects, you know, what clients are doing, you know, with data and AI, right? So now your transactions are coming you know, into the system, right? So these transactions could be, you know, credit card swipes, could be, you know, they fill out a web form and, and then they supply, they could be applying for a claim, they could be, and then you've got this, you know, sort of uh, IOT, uh, this could be, you know, chats, uh, this could be sensors, uh, this could be a whole lot of information that's coming in. So imagine if, you know, uh, you, you, from your favorite credit card provider, uh, some some of the credit card providers actually give you an app, and in the app you can check a box that says you're okay with sharing your location, right? So you do a credit card swipe, you're in Miami, uh, but then the location you choose to um, share your location information, but your location information says that you know uh, that you're in Denver. So you could prob you could possibly be you know uh, subject to fraud here because you know locations kind of showing that you know the transactions or location. And the origin of the transaction are in you know different um, coming from different places, so so that data is now coming into an operational data store, and then as I said before, as the transaction strikes the database as part of the insert operation, you could fire a set of models that actually compare this location right and immediately invalidate that transaction, or you could send it off to a bucket that says it requires you know further investigation. So the operational store has data that is fresh. Right, and then you've got the data warehouses that usually accrues data over six months, one year, two years. Right, that's inside your data warehouses, and then here too, you have a lot of data scientists that are running queries against that data warehouse, and you know, trying to get insights. Right, so for example, you could look at a year's worth of transactions, and then say, um, you know, let's say you're you're doing you know research on a particular a, you know ATM or a particular point of sale location. Where you've been swiping these credit cards, and you and you find that there's always these weird high-value transactions coming in when there's like a, a ball game or a sports activity happening. So 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 maybe there's some 
fraudsters out there that are trying to, you know, uh, uh, trying to um, uh, get some of these, uh, uh, you know, numbers from the magnetic swipes and trying to do some kind of a, uh, you know, illegal activity. So, so you could go and search on these things and then, you know, look for outliers and then use AI models as part of your SQL queries, right? So that you can, you know, um, you know, uh, get this information in the uh, on the fly. And then some of our clients that take the data from these traditional uh, data stores, right? Uh, your relational databases and your data warehouses, and they put them into a modern database, which could be a graph database, could be a key value store, just like Hadoop. And then this is where, you know, uh, we've been focusing a lot in the last several years, as I told you about this AI grid. This is where, you know, you're training the models, lots of data scientists, you know, running their big jobs, sometimes for days, and you're building these, you know, and this is, you can see is where the data science zoo is, you know, Python, um, you know, uh, scikit-learn, right? And all the, all the languages and, and your, your data science zoos over here. And what we're seeing now is that, and some of you might have heard about the Power Systems Virtual Cloud, where a lot of folks, you know, when they buy a box, a lot of our clients, they get credits. And this is where, you know, you can actually uh, create, uh, you know, for an instance, uh, where, for example, uh, SAP HANA is certified for the cloud, you could create a, a database, you could, uh, you know, essentially have a microservice running here so that, uh, you know, a business process or your software product on the, some of these operational systems can go and then call that microservice inside the public cloud. So you can use this for dev tests, you can use it for a production ins instance. And I give you an example for this we're seeing is becoming an emerging platform for AI, right? Because you can keep your traditional IT infrastructure here that's, you know, closely guarded, you know, resilient, well protected, has to follow very strict qualities of service, but some of your AI stuff is very experimental. So you can then uh, take your AI uh, infrastructure that, you know, clients are playing with and then put this in the IBM cloud. So let's say you, you want to be, one of the things that's happening is, you know, in this contactless world is, you know, a documentation, right? Paper documentation. And so people are trying to, you know, be, be digital as much as possible in terms of paper documentation. So you scan the document, you upload it, but then, you know, for regulatory purposes, you do eventually send the, uh, uh, the paper in through, you know, the post office. But what if you wanted to extract from this digital document, the PDF document, you know, a bunch of fields, right? And let's say, you know, uh, these are very complex documents. You have to do compliance because you have to make sure that the data that's inside these fields, you know, is compliant with some of the, let's say, health, let's say it's a healthcare claim and all these healthcare regulations. And you want to be able to look at the compliance rules database, match it with the healthcare claim and do these things. And let's say, you know, you're doing this in a very DevOps, really agile manner, clearly putting that into a, you know, highly robust operational store that is, the IT folks are probably going to push back, but then you could, you know, maybe put this inside IBM Cloud and then provide a microservice. So even though this is agile and experimental, you don't have to break anything on the operational side, but then you can experiment and be agile about some of the AI assets you're creating. So this is kind of a, a very uh, simple way to experiment with things and prototype, uh, you know, AI assets as you bring them uh, into your systems. Um, so, so when you look at these uh, enterprise AI infusion scenarios, um, you know, for uh, the products you're building and for the clients you're deploying your uh, assets on, we kind of really look at these three use cases. So one aspect, as I told you, is you have a pre-built model. You can build that anywhere. You might have an x86 cluster where you're running classic SaaS. You build that model, right? And because our uh, runtime system, our inferencing infusion system, talks the same model protocol language, you can bring that model and then run it on a power system, right? But you've trained it anywhere and you can run it on, uh, on a power system. So, and then um, on power system, especially for, you know, what we call machine learning, let's say with Python, you can build these machine learning models on a power system, right? And then deploy them, you know, on your uh, business applications that, uh, that you're, you know, running at your clients. In some cases, you might build a model where you're develop, you co-develop the model with your application because you have enough data to build that model. So let's say you have a model uh, to do a chatbot, right? And you're in the healthcare space, then you could provide a basic model that understands the, so let's say the English language and understands, you know, basic healthcare terms, but then 
if you are an insurance provider, then you could have several uh, business specific terms that are proprietary to the business. So those words would have to be trained on at the client site, right? Because that's business proprietary. So what you do is you supply a model that understands the English language and that you know the outer uh, ring uh, understands healthcare terms, but then you go and customize that model on site, right? With the business proprietary language, right? So that kind of building and customization of models we also allow on power systems. And then you can then go and, and deploy that into. So you either code de build a model, code develop the model along with your application, right? At your development site, you bring it to the client side, maybe do some customizations, or maybe you might add new models because you're looking at other proprietary customer data that you don't have access to at your, uh, you know, at your development site. And then, then you can operationalize your AI application. The other way, uh, the third use case, and we'll, which we'll talk about is what we call auto AI. And this is uh, tools that we're providing so that if you want to learn from text, if you want to learn from time series data and do uh, you know, forecasting, time series forecasting, then you don't have to write a lot of code. These are the uh, new set of tools that are called no code or zero code tools that if you've been following the space, um, you know, and that's also, by the way, called software 2.0, right? Uh, software 2.0 is about uh, being able to synthesize code, right? And using AIs to write code rather than spending a lot of time developing the code, right? And I talked to you about GPT-3, where you can write one sentence on, okay, uh, you know, I want to construct a web browser that can do this, right? It, you write it in the English language and the code generator actually writes out the code. So, so that's what, uh, that's the world we're trying to get into is also make, uh, uh, your your job easier so that when you if you provided a spreadsheet of data it'll automatically try and select the important features so the features are for example say columns in the database and uh, um, you want to be able to select the right features because you know depending on which feature you choose if you select too many features you might need more data to train the model but if you select too many features you may not get the too few features you may not get the right accuracy but then you want to be able to experiment in terms of what is the right set of features and the right number of features that get me the best accuracy, which means iterating and running through a lot of these models. We have tools that will do that for you, right? That will do automatic feature selection, automatic feature engineering. So you don't have to spend hours constructing these experiments, but these tools, you know, working with some of our partners will do that for you. And I'm going to touch on that, uh, you know, very quickly. So we've kind of made this whole process uh, you know, very, very simple. And these are the kind of the three use cases that you frequently encounter as you build your software products at your development sites, bring them to your client sites, and then customize them at your client sites, either based on new data, new use cases, or, or as you customize them for the proprietary nature of your client's business. So, so on AIX, IBM I, and Linux, you know, we have several, so what we've done in AIX is we take a lot of the open source tools and we're making them available as the AIX toolbox. So you can get Python there, right? Uh, and then a lot of these libraries like NumPy that are, and, and scikit-learn that are used for, you know, data preparation, machine learning. Um, and similarly in IBMI as well, you have the tools. So you can do uh, machine learning in a pretty sophisticated way. Then it's a proof of concept if you're looking to do deep learning, which is, you know, learning from images and, and, and you know, doing sophisticated uh, you, you know, question and answer and things like that, then we do provide access to some of the latest uh, uh, deep learning tools. Um, and then on IBM I as well, we have these additional tools, for example, like GBM and XGBoost are what's called classifiers, right? So if, you're, if you wanna classify, look at data and classify as a good transaction, a bad transaction, or, or maybe even you know, classify a credit profile for a business or a consumer uh, at, you know, into different grades, then you can use these uh, multi-class classifiers that are provided by XGBoost to be able to do that. Um, now on Linux, those of you who've been working with us uh, you know, on Watson Machine Learning Community Edition, we were essentially building these packages and libraries for you, right? And, um, you know, we're now, uh, you know, going to be, um, um, uh, and, and also we've been uh, providing, you know, the AutoML tool, uh, H2O driverless AI. And then, um, 
we also provide these capabilities, what I talked about, Onyx on AIX, where you can build, let's say, models on Linux and then, you know, kind of bring them over, um, you know, to the AIX side. So let's just take a, you know, a quick example to sort of understand how the end-to-end -end flow kind of looks like. So um, as I said before, this is uh, on the left-hand side um, is your IBM Power System where you could be running IBM I with IBM DB2, um, or you could have a Linux VM, right? And then you could have another LPAR, or you could have another system that's uh, essentially, you know, doing your model building. Um, and, and, and so what you do first is, and let's say, you know, you, you, you bring your application onto the client side. So this is now your client side. Your application is running in this LPAR or cluster. And so the first thing you do is you have to feed that with data. So you ETL extract transform load out of the database, that data, and then bring it into your favorite file system or operational store, you know, on the right-hand side where your model building is running. You build the model and then uh, you then save that model and then you go into the step that we call scoring, right? Uh, so you push that model either into AIX or IBM I or Linux. So in this case, that model could go into your business applications that issuing SQL queries, right? It could be that your business application is running on a separate platform and you, over the network, you're pulling data and then you're doing inferencing or scoring or you're doing those predictions and, and decision making. But so you can kind of get an understanding of what, so what I told you, right? So you extract the data out, you then clean the data, do your data prep, you go feed it into the model, you train the model, right? And then once you train the model and we, you know, I'm going to, uh, you know, and the tools that I described in the last page, um, you can then take the trained model and then push it, you know, down into the database, into DB2, um, you, or into your business process or the client's business process so that you can then, you know, get these predictions and, and, and you're able to do the scoring uh, in a seamless way. So that's essentially the flow, the end-to-end -end flow by which you pull the data out, you do the data prep, you train the model, you get the final model, and then you push the model uh, for scoring and, um, you know, uh, or what's called inferencing, right, uh, decision-making, you know, onto the operational system where your business applications are running. And then you, uh, you, you sometimes collect these predictions and, and you monitor, you monitor the models and make sure that they're uh, not drifting. And so we provide tools on that side as well, either through our partner H2O or we have uh, IBM products like Watson OpenScale that help you do the model monitoring so that you can, you know, keep abreast with the change in the data so that your predictions are not extremely off and, and you're keeping uh, with, the, with the KPIs of the business. So, so this is a product that, uh, that I've been talking about. So uh, for, for those of you who might not know, uh, H2O is a, is a key IBM partner and they have created a revolution um, in the AI space, uh, H2O.AI, uh, by building um, this uh, tool called driverless AI. And, and this is literally a data scientist in a box. So let's say you're a business that wants to focus, you know, mostly on the data that you want to focus on the application, but you don't want to hire a big team of data scientists to, uh, so what this is doing is this is providing you the capability to essentially be a data scientist in a box, right? So it will do the feature engineering and the feature selection for you by running experiments that are recipes for various domains, various verticals that you can use, uh, models, um, uh, scores for inferencing, pre-built scoring and inferencing that you can use, say, for credit risk analysis, for classification transformers that look at the data, clean it, transform it from one format to the other so that you can, um, you know, readily apply it. Because sometimes models don't take alphanumeric data. You act actually have to normalize it into a numeric format. So you need these transformers so you can actually feed it into the model. And then if you have, say, time series data, say sales data, or, you know, other time series data, say uh, data coming out from a sensor, then, um, you know, you can readily apply this because it's got uh, tools to let you, uh, and then you can feed it text and natural language data from your chatbots. And if you're kind of, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what is the sentiment of, uh, 
uh, you know, I, 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 you know, you deployed your new or you did an upgrade to your software product and you're trying to get a sentiment of, uh, you know, all the IT users, what do they feel about the upgrade and if they're, you know, and so you could put a sentiment analysis engine um, and, and then kind of get an understanding of that in real time very, very quickly. So what driverless AI does is it creates like a, a Java object and you can run this JVM, right? So, so the jar file and the JVM on your platform. So it makes it very simple. So you, all, all you have to do is as long as you can run, your application can run uh, a Java object, then it becomes easy. Even if it doesn't run a Java object, you can do a, a call into uh, the Java Mojo file. And then, um, um, you know, for advanced users, they, if your application is written in Assembler or C, we do provide ways by which you can access these models that have been built in driverless AI as well. So a very, very cool, and, and nifty tool, and, and those of you interested, we can do some deeper dives on how to use this, but this does take the pain out of using AI and makes it very easy to apply AI uh, in a very easy way, and you focus on your application logic and focus on the data and not have to you know, keep up with, um, uh, with you know, all the uh, uh, churn uh, you know, happening with open source and, and the data science world. Um, so, so let me just uh, quickly kind of wrap up. We have a few charts here, but I think I already talked about this, but I, I do want to sort of uh, end with a few examples. So we talked about where AI can be deployed. We said that you can make models as path, as part of the transaction envelope, right? Because if I can go and do an inference, make a decision at the speed of the transaction, then I can reduce that time to action. So we talked about you know, uh, pre-approvals, so risk and fraud scoring, right? Being able to score a credit card application, you know, very, very quickly. I'm at a point of sale terminal uh, and I'm able to now give you additional credit, right? So that you can close the sale. So you're now you're going, you're driving up your sales volume because you're able to do this at, 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 at you know, real time. And so it's reducing your time to action. And the operational side where as your data is flowing into your operational store, you're able to look at your transaction, just like what Amazon does, dynamic price optimization based on inventory, anomaly detection on the fly. And especially when during this digital transformation, this is becoming so critical because on the fly, you wanna be able to do that anomaly detection, be able to do that intraday forecasting so that you can allocate resources in your supply chain, in your, in your infrastructure to keep up with the speed of the digital um, uh, you know, interaction that's happening with the business. And this we talked about, you know, in the AI grid, the comprehensive side, where you take all your historical, if you're allowed to store, if your client is allowed to store data for seven years, then all that historical data is then available on that cluster. So you can look at historical patterns over a range of time and then be able to, so there you're looking at things like, okay, have I been in compliance for, you know, the last seven years? Can I do long-term forecasting? How do I do resource optimization? Or the last time you had, uh, a similar, you know, crisis, uh, uh, hopefully not like the pandemic we're going through or, or where you had, um, you know, uh, increased digital volume. Is this something that you can learn from the data to help you do things in a better way? So, so, so we think there's incredible value uh, to, to br bringing models close to the business applications, close to the transactions. We talked about the time to insight, time to action. I mean, this is so critical, right? Because as the data is arriving, your data is fresh. So being able to act on that fresh data and get that close to real time insight versus, you know, waiting for an ETL to happen and data going into, you know, uh, some kind of a data warehouse. And then, uh, so, so in this business, as, as you know, in IT, we always want to try and go to where the hockey puck is going to go to and not where it has been. So being able to keep up with where uh, things will go to is so very key. So having access to that fresh data is, is, is so very important. And, um, and, and so as you know, you know we, we, we have infrastructure in place so that we can you know, lower the latency between these data stores and where the model is actually executing. And so, so especially um, as this digital transformation happens, being able to provide uh, inferencing, decision making, prediction, uh, and injecting these models in the path of these transactions 
into your business process is very, very critical. Um, uh, so this is a bunch of examples uh, that are in this deck, but I do want to end with this example. So this is a, a bank in Paraguay that was trying to do some credit risk scoring. Um, so one of the things that they noticed was that using their existing models, their acceptance rates are very, very low because of the fact that um, they were not able to train sophisticated models in the batch window um, so that they could uh, actually build so-called ensemble. So a model ensemble is you have a set of models that are able to look at, uh, say, a customer profile in a broad way. And when you look at it in a more broader way, you might be able to, um, you know, make the risk analysis decisions much faster and also maybe even be able to accept customers uh, even faster because of the fact that you might have not looked at historical or you might have not looked at some additional data that they have. So being able to do more models and train more models and being able to experiment with more models allowed them to build this ensemble using H2O driverless AI very quickly. So they were able to reduce the batch window to build these models and not just one model, but an ensemble of models. And then as um, you know, the credit risk analysis decisions were to be made because they were done in this uh, Mojo file, they're able to do that much faster as well. And, and then now they, you know, because they get data and, and, and so they could now let driverless AI worry about the features and the data and, and, and have their data scientists and their business professionals focus more on the application logic and, and making the system run seamlessly so they could do, be more effective at this. And so this is uh, an example of how uh, a driverless AI can help you, uh, you know, make your business process more seamless. So I wanna end with uh, the announcement that we had uh, this week. Uh, so we did announce our new uh, uh, Power 10 family. Um, and as you can see here, uh, we have an AI optimized silicon accelerator, which is very, very exciting. Uh, to make your, um, you know, AI applications run much, much faster. And then, um, um, and, and, and so we're really excited about that. And then uh, I just want to kind of end with, you know, we've, we're getting some early performance numbers and, and you can see the current generation Power 9, uh, we're now able to actually get a 10X improvement in inference on some of the models. And then, um, you know, some of these models can be done in uh, different uh, numerical formats. And you can, um, you, you know, actually run, do the inferencing in some of these different numerical formats and even go faster. So if you use some of these other numerical formats, so so-called int eight, you can even get a 20x improvement. So you imagine being able to do inferencing 10x faster than the, than the previous generation. So this is really, really exciting. So this means that I can have more applications that are requesting inferencing from this engine. And now you can have more and more microservices more and more business applications that can run in a scalable way on this platform. So very, very excited about this. We made this announcement just this week and I wanna share that with you. So we're uh, continuously investing in AI at all levels in the software, in the hardware, and we wanna make sure that we uh, deliver a platform for you that is trusted end to end. So this is what I kinda wanna leave you with. So our focus is going to be on inferencing. We're, uh, uh, we're giving you tools like H2O driverless AI, uh, that allow you to lower the barrier of entry, either if you're getting started with AI or a sophisticated AI user. We do want to assist you in your journey. Either you're getting started, you're trying to figure out how AI is useful to your business, or even if you're now ready to add your next AI use case. And so if you'd like to schedule a technical deep dive, there's an email there, but that's kind of where I want to end and uh, hand it uh, back to Gina um, so that uh, she can um, conclude this webcast. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, um, and I think that we probably might have time for questions as well. Thanks, Raj. All right, excellent. Um, that was very, very informative. Thank you so much. And, and I think a key focus for us in the, the revitalization work um, and re-engagement work, the relationship that we're building with our ISVs, um, this presents some great opportunities for for you to take advantage of, of the technology that we have to offer, right? And you may have your own um, AI technology that could run on our platform as well. Um, and we can work through ways that either you leverage ours or, or we incorporate yours um, out to our mutual clients. 
So I just, I do want to do a quick wrap up here and I think we may have time for, for one question. Um, uh, so uh, partnership opportunities, we always, always cover these. Um, so I'll just go through them very quickly, but we do offer free access to power system hardware so that you can, you know, test, um, uh, support the latest version of, of the operating system. Some of the new features will have these ramped up for Power 10 as well um, so that you can test. Oops, I think we just jumped back a chart there. Um, we also have, as I, as I mentioned, technical reviews that you can request as well as co-creation labs where we do, you know, a workshop. It could be, you know, how to support your journey to cloud, um, how to support some of the AI technology um, that Raj protect Raj presented today. Um, so those are available to you and we already, already covered the, the resource center as well. So um, with that, I think we, we have, um, let's just take one question and then when the webcast ends, I would just, you know, just a, a quick reminder um, about ISB webcasts that are coming up um, in September. Um, we'll actually be covering um, uh, Power 10 in September, as I mentioned earlier. So um, let's take one question here um, and then and then please take time to fill out that survey survey because it does guide you know the the future um, topics that we cover. So Raj, we do have one in the the reader here that we didn't get to in the Q and A, and that is as well as the improvements in inference speed for Power 10. Um, are there any indications as to potentially how much faster AI model training in is in P10 versus versus P9? Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you if you can take that one or um, uh, and maybe just quickly address it before we get to the poll. Yeah, so so I think the the short answer is stay tuned. So so you know. Uh, uh, if you read the press release uh, for this Power 10 announcement, you know, these products are being targeted for the second half of next year. And, and so this is our first, I would say, uh, splash uh, sharing this uh, inferencing, um, uh, you know, numbers with you, which are, you know, early numbers. And, and so, you know, as we get closer to general availability, we'll be sharing more performance uh, results for a broader swath of workloads. Um, and, and as I said, a lot of our uh, emphasis will be on uh, the end software, which is, you know, the IC, so the software that you guys are building, uh, the software that we're, you know, working with uh, other end users. Um, and, and, and as we uh, get closer to the second half of 2020, we'll be sharing a lot more of that uh, information with you. So thanks for the question. All right, excellent. Thank you.